The reality is that if you don't have the right unit economics in the concept, you will likely die. So don't worry about that one, right? Let's get it, let's get it right. Do the latter. Give me the right unit economics. Um, just focus on the prior. Unit economics, otherwise you will die. So the panel is here, uh, starting right off, off my, uh, my left, is uh, Mike Snyder. He's uh, been around a little bit. In the, in the initial slide, I had him at 26 years of experience. He got mad at me because I was making him two years younger, so I put 28. <laughs> been around a little bit. Here's, uh, you can see uh, some, of the, some of his track record right now. He's with Nukes, and he's going to tell you about Nukes and what Nukes is, uh, is all about. Uh, but it's been a lot of places, uh, Corner Bakery, Brinker, uh, and now Nukes, uh, as well as Ecotrack, which is a software that, um, that he's worked on. Uh, one of the key uh, results that he had is he took Corner Bakery from a mainly company base to a franchise base. Those of you that have done that, you know what that's all about. So that's, that's pretty big. Along the way also, cost reduction to make it more, more feasible to, to develop, to, to grow a brand. Uh, so again, a lot, a lot of different brands, a lot of different prototypes. Welcome to the panel, Mike. Thank you. Dominic Talavera, he's a young man in the group, right? Only 22 years uh, old here. That, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> young. <laughs> kind of young. Word, young okay, at heart. 22 years young. Uh, he's with Johnny Rockets. Uh, he oversees international expansion. Um, done a lot of projects, and you're going to see some exciting stuff about a real interesting case study that if you, you've not read, it's been in the industry press about what Johnny Rockets has done that fits perfectly with what this topic is. Right? Along, along with that, he's had other, other background, other experience with a few, a few brands. Uh, myself, uh, we uh, Profitality, and I'll tell you a little bit about Profitality uh, later. It's an industrial engineering consulting firm. What we do is we help brands drive unit economics. And I'll go through what unit economic really means, right? Because some of you think it's one thing, perhaps it's not, and I'll ask help from a panelist as to what is unit economics. That's, a, that's an important piece. All right? So I'm going to hand it over to Mike to talk about nukes. OK. So nukes, nukes is a fast uh, casual concept out of Jackson, Mississippi. We, um, we're looking more to, on our interior finish, I'd like to see in a picture here, we're trying to be a, more of a high-end, fast, casual finish out. So um, it's um, a challenge there, too, because, again, when you go to high-end, you're still looking at some additional finish out cost. Um, we're a scratch kitchen where everything is made, everything's chopped, sliced, cooked um, in, in, in the store itself, so we're not getting any processed food coming in, any pre-done pre food. And then also with the concept, we are um, we, most first generation end cap finish outs. Um, we are also doing some second generation spaces that are non-traditional retail to restaurants or um, office buildings. And also we have some freestanding prototypes as well too. Um, last year I think we did five freestanding. So freestanding seems to be the new in in, in our concept. Um, a lot of franchisees like land. Um, so. That's a little bit about nukes. Um, How many of you have been to a nukes? Open kitchen, very, very open kitchen, right? You almost see everything except, except for prep. And we were talking about perhaps they should see some of it. Yes. So we're a brand built for growth. Um, right now, currently 112 uh, units. As you can kind of see, we're heavy in the southeast. Uh, we started in Jackson. And so, um, but also you can see too, the, all the red areas, basically the areas we built out. So as we start to expand and go into um, other markets, um, there is that brand recognition issue that you have to deal with. Um, rents, are, of course, are a lot more expensive when you get outside of Mississippi and Louisiana. So those are, those are challenges right there. So um, as we expand, we're also trying to expand. We're almost touching states, looking at the logistics, looking at the supply source, all those things that, that do affect the unit level operation, the unit level economics. So. Um, we have some challenges with the, with the brand, like everybody knows. Um, of course, I'm trying to reduce the footprint, but also when 68% of your, day, uh, your sales come with the lunch day part in that two hours, how much can you reduce that? How many seats can you lose? So you have to really start looking at party counts for seats. So a lot of those different type of uh, exercises we're doing. And again, last year, 2016, 
It's a good year for nukes. It's got a lot of national recognition. With national recognition, of course, um, generates a little bit of franchise growth and franchise excitement. So um, we're going to try to take that and continue to move on. Again, accepting our challenges and continue to try to evolve the brand. So that's a little bit about nukes. Now, Dominic's going to walk us through Johnny Rockets, but before he does that, he promised. What did Johnny Rockets servers do? They dance. He promised Everybody he says dance. Sing. Dance, yes. I said I would dance as long as Mike danced with me. Do yeah. it, baby. Yeah. yeah. What, what's the dance? <laughs> yeah. I, I'll, pay to, I'll pay to see that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Johnny Rockets is a 30 year old brand. Um, you know, we have about 380 locations uh, currently globally a little over 200 locations uh, in the domestic USA, and of that, uh, 25 are corporate locations. Um, you know, because we were an old brand and everybody knew us as this classic diner, we got a little stagnant. And about three years ago, um, Sun Capital, our owners, uh, brought in a, a gentleman named James Walker who invigorated the brand, and we started looking at alternative venues. Um, how can we get Johnny Rockets out of the malls and out in other locations, uh, the non-traditional locations. So um, globally, uh, it was uh, a great year for Johnny Rockets. Um, I don't know how many people here have the international uh, brands, but you know I see you guys out there uh, as I travel. And we opened uh, six new countries this year: um, China, Peru, Uruguay—I mean Paraguay, Bolivia, and, and uh, my favorite, Italy. And then we had one location in Bangladesh, which we don't like to talk about. But um, so great, great year, 2016. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, with 10% growth is what we had last year, and, and that's going into alternative venues, trying to find these small units that we can fit into. We opened two drive-throughs this last year for Johnny Rockets, which um, you know everybody said, "How can you open a drive-through?" We're Burgers cooked fresh to order, but, but we did that and, and very successful. Um, so we're looking forward to, uh, you know, 2017. Thank you. That's pretty good. Uh, and Profitality, I, I, you heard me say earlier, what we are is a, an industrial engineering consulting firm. Uh, and if you, if you look at the word Profitality, it's all about driving profits and hospitality at the same time. Because you can do one without the other very easily. You can drive profits, but your ter service is terrible. Or you can have great, great super service, and your profit may not be. How do you balance the two is, is a trick. And I'll, I'll share with you how we do that at the end as to how do we drive, how do we look at unit economics, how, how do we drive it. But at the end of the day, you've got to do both. We apply industrial engineering and ergonomics. That's really our, the method to our madness. Uh, that's our differentiating proposition. Uh, at the end of the day, unit economics rules. Without it, you can't grow a brand healthily, right? And long term, and I don't know if healthy is that a word. It could be. It could be now. Yeah, part profitality Spanish, wasn't English. a word. You know, I'm waiting for Webster <laughs> to pick it up. So, <laughs> anyhow, so yeah, that's that's what we do. Uh, just our experience is pretty pretty vast. Um, June 2016, I pick up the NRA magazine and top 100. I start reading. I say, well, I know that one. I know that one. I know that one. And at the end of the day, it was over 50 percent. So we cut cut across every restaurant concept, whether it's QSR, fast casual, casual dine, family dine, coffee shops. It doesn't doesn't matter. Uh, so, so again, it's a lot of fun. It's a great industry. I love it, uh, and that's why I'm here. And I would never leave it. I, I landed here by mistake, 33 years ago, and I haven't left. <laughs> right? So, like probably most of you have stories like 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 mine. But uh, anyhow, so let me start by what we're going to do is is we're going to tease you a little bit with the topic. Then I'm going to ask Dominic to walk us through some case studies. So you see. Uh, how he drove unit economics. Then I'll ask Mikey here to walk you through another case study. Um, it's a case study that he and I worked on, uh, so he'll have asked me to pitch in a little bit along the way. But you'll see how you drive unit economics. But let me start by saying, uh, what is it? Usually people say, well, reducing cost, right? That's what comes out first, right? And, and, and Dominic is gonna show you an example as to why that's not the case, right? With one particular piece of equipment, that at first costs you more money, but in the long haul, it drives unit economics, right? Uh, so it's not reducing costs. Really, if you think about, I'm an engineer, and if I sound like one, no apologies, that's what I am. Uh, unit economics is an equation, right? It's output over input. Sometimes concepts will drive unit economics by making the facility smaller, but at half the volume. That's not the idea, right? You got the same unit economics. If your top goes down by half and your bottom equation goes down by half, you didn't do anything. Right? So it's a function of getting more output, less input, 
and unit economics drives in the, in the right direction. So if you think about it, it's sales capacity over cost, right? And like I said before, uh, you may have to drive more cost in one area to drive sales, but sales trumps everything else. There's no, no, doubt, no doubt about it. Any, any comments on, uh, on that? No, you, you hit the uh, nail on the head. I mean, really, people talk about value engineering. I hate that word. Um, you know, we're trying to drive sales. We're trying to get more people in there. We're trying to get throughput through the restaurant. And, and that's what really, to me, unit economics is making sound decisions, but really driving that sales number up. Excellent. I mean, I think a lot of times value engineering is not really well thought out because you're not thinking about what you're doing to the operating cost ongoing. So again, say you build a restaurant, the sales aren't where you need to be, but you value engineer and all of a sudden now you have increased operating costs, you've really driven death. So I think that's some of the things that we talked about. That uh... Excellent. Thank you. So, so unit economics has many tentacles and, and I'm going to, my next slide is going to sort of tell you what stage in life I'm in, right? Anybody know who that is? <laughs> Ursula. Ursula, from what? Little Mermaid, right? I've got grandchildren, right? So it has many tentacles. It has many areas. One could be operating cost. That's easy, right? That's the one people think of the most, operating cost. The other one is service, top side of the equation. The other one could be quality, right? Without quality and food safety, those are non-negotiables. You have nothing. You don't have a brand, right? And we were talking earlier that menu starts, everything starts with the menu and it goes up, right? But as you're doing the menu, make sure that you do it efficiently. Otherwise, you may be taking the unit economics in the wrong direction. Sales and peak throughput, right? There's a, most concepts have an hour or two at lunch or at breakfast or at dinner to really cap with a captive audience, right? If you have any bottlenecks, you're gonna feel it. So it's all about reducing one bottleneck at a time uh, to, to get there. Uh, space, right? 4,000 square feet costs so much, 3,000 square feet, last time I checked, will cost around 25% less. Not quite, but 20. <laughs> That's the engineer in me, right? It's just, just space, it doesn't only cost, but it also makes people walk more and you have more AC and you have more waste. It's just, it's a domino effect. It's a domino effect. So space is very, very, uh, very important. And of course, you know, capital cost, equipment cost, right? Construction cost. That's the capital side of the equation. Any other areas? Uh, it looks like you got it covered. I picked up, actually I picked up a new one with, with Roger's presentation today, right? Sustainability, right? And, and governance. That's got a cost to it. But it has a benefit, and I think the number was five point was it five point six percent higher in ca in capital value when you do the right things. That's powerful, but when you look at that initially, it's probably going to have a cost. So all of a sudden you're in the wrong side of the equation, and you say, "Whoa, hang on a second, this is not going well." But you know, at the end of the day, it's it's a total aspect of it. So, so why worry about? Uh, Unit economics, right? Again, just shareholder value. Whomever your shareholder is, whether it's yourself, whether it's your shareholder, whether you're public, whether you're private, it doesn't matter. You're owned by a capital, uh, private equity firm. It doesn't matter. It's about driving value, right? And uh, something that I always tell people, and this is one of my, my favorite battles with, um, with space designers. I'm sure there's some of them here. That's okay. No worries. We're still friends, right? Uh, is, is if you build it, they may not come. So be careful what size you build. Right? Just, just let's, let's build it right. Uh, I heard today uh, the, the Outback uh, Blooming Brands uh, uh, speaker talked about their business is going remotely, right? Delivery. So he gave me another way to tell my clients that the front of house should be a lot smaller too. Because if the business is not using the front of house, if your drive through is going from 50 to 60 to 70 to 80, why, you know, why, why does it have to be so big? I understand there's a care for balance, right? But these are the sorts of things that, that we look at uh, as we do, as we go about um, doing it. So we got to build it right from the get-go. Thank you, Juan. So uh, let me first talk about the high efficiency kitchen and where it, uh, where the birthplace was. So um, three years ago, we decided that we were going to try and create a drive-through restaurant. So we said, how are we going to do this? you know, fresh to uh, burgers to the window. How do we do this in a drive through environment? So we, um, at the NRA show, we met with Taylor uh, and, and really loved their presentation on the clamshell griddle. So we bought one, took it into a test kitchen, bought all the accompanied piece of equipment, and we brought our whole ops team in and played with it until we got a layout that worked and started developing our drive through 
And then a light bulb went off, and uh, I said, if we can do this in a drive-thru, why can't we do it in all our other venues? Why can't we put this kitchen in, in our traditional locations, food court locations? So uh, that's what we did, and we actually worked with Taylor to create a, a heavy platen griddle for us because, I don't know if you know about Johnny Rockets, but um, you know, they're not form patties. They're fresh pucks or they're bulk beef that gets smashed. So we wanted to recreate that with the uh, heavy platen. So we started this journey three years ago, and last year I think we, we opened uh, probably 95% of the locations with the clamshell griddle. And what we found um, is, you know, they cook burgers in one minute. They put, so what happens? We, we have a bottleneck now at the make line. So what do we do? We got to start working. Our ops team had to work uh, with different pieces of equipment to overcome that bottleneck. Um, second thing is we had shakes that were taking anywhere from five to six minutes to make. We had to create, uh, go back to Taylor, and we started working with them on their uh, uh, soft serve machine created for Johnny Rockets. So what we found with this high efficiency kitchen is that um, our throughput and our peak hours went up 58%. So when our franchisees start telling me they don't want to buy this piece of equipment, they'd rather have more seats, put it on furniture, I try to explain them the throughput alone is like having more seats. So if you get people in and out, you don't need as many seats as they were. So we were able to get that footprint down. We were able to go into food court locations. Uh, we were able to purchase smaller hoods, uh, compact kitchens. And uh, I can tell you, it was a big growth year. Like I said, it was a record year for Johnny Rockets in 2016. And it had a lot to do with us going into these smaller spaces, utilizing this high efficiency kitchen. And uh, you know, yeah, it's substantially more expensive. Uh, but when you look over the life of your return on investment, you're going to, you know, we're, we're always trying to hit that three-year return on investment. So you spread that over that three years, and, uh, you know, we made that, I think, in the first six months of, of business with this high efficiency kitchen. So, um, you know, I, I highly recommend you guys go back to your ops team and, and really work with them on how to improve that throughput, because that's what's going to make a difference in these smaller venues. You want to go through this through this specific? Uh... Yeah, it's it's basically what I said. You know, the flat griddles. Uh, you know, I'd say it's a third of the cost, um, but you make that money back very quickly. Um, you know, it just makes good financial sense. This is uh, this is one of those I was telling you that by looking at the cost, this is what you do to this to this uh, piece of equipment from a unit economics perspective, right? It doesn't make the cut. Simple. If you stop there, you're shallow because. There's a lot more. Yeah, so the franchisees, they're, you know, they're dead set against it. And, and uh, quick story, so I, we go down to Mexico City at the Six Flags, and it's a multi-million dollar location for us, and they did buy the griddle, but they weren't trained properly, so we went down there, the ops team went down there, I went with them, and as they're, they're tweaking the griddle, they're showing them how to use it, I'm standing to the side, and I'm watching this girl making a sh uh, two shakes. She got two shakes, put the cups up there, and I sat there and I started my timer. And I watched her make two shakes, and it took her seven and a half minutes. So I see this line of people, and I'm all, look at this bottleneck. So I pulled the manager over, I showed him the timer, we talked about it. He said, can we put one of those shake machines here? And so now we redesigned it, now they're buying a shake machine because they had another bottleneck. So they were able to get the burgers out, but they weren't able to complete the orders. Yeah, and usually what happens is as you fix one bottleneck, you hit the next. If you hit the second, you hit the next. Somewhere along that spectrum, you can't afford to fix the next one, and you stop. But that's called, as an engineer, as I told you, I warned you, it's called theory of constraints. You hit one, then the next one, then the next one, and you decide where you want to stop. And you may decide to stop on phase one and the first one, and later on do second or the third one. But that, that's important to know because you know, at first, this, this plant clamshell was an X, but the reality, it's a check, and it made it. And it drove impact. Yeah, and a couple of unit economics. A couple other things is consistency of product. So uh, with these pieces of equipment, we've been able to uh, have a comp consistent product globally. So anybody that has this system and they buy into it, we try to explain to them. You know, there's no guesswork anymore. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, alternative venues like theme parks. You know, their turnover rate, every year they got a new staff. You know, we've got everything programmed in this thing. It's it's programmable with the flash drive. Um, they hit a button, it goes down, it, the, you know, there's no science to it. 
for them. You know, it's already taken care of. Uh, also, the labor cost. You know, you think about the labor of, of having to, to uh, get around that kitchen and flipping the burgers. You know, we've taken away some of that. Um, and, you know, with the, you know, the rates going up, you know, you're having to pay people more. You know, it makes sense. And the food safety as well. Oh. So, um, you know, here's an example of, of three of the prototypes we rolled out. Well, two of them we rolled out in 2016, and we've designed a kiosk now that uh, we have partners that are bringing us locations. So in 2017, uh, we'll probably have at least a dozen kiosk uh, locations uh, throughout the U.S., Canada, and some in Europe. So. Yeah, and this is, this is an example where flexibility is the key, right? One size does not fit all. If you want to grow, you better have sites and concepts that fit well. And I don't know about nukes in the area of of being flexible around design. Yeah, we're, you know, we're, <clears throat> right now we're, we're looking at the online ordering, prepaid, you know, all the things in our fast casual section of, hey, increasing catering. Do we do a drive through window? Is that drive through window a, a drive through pickup window or is it a full drive through execution? So we're, we're right now looking at all those different elements to see what we can do because, again, as you reduce that interior footprint, we gotta find ways to get sales outside our four walls. So we're, we're, right now, we're in a very um, design growth mentality um, as, as we continue, because 112 stores continue to grow out into those markets. We have to think outside the box. We can't, we can't keep doing business the way we're doing today. It's just not going to work. How about, how about online ordering? What, what's, uh, what's in that horizon for, for the YouTube? Jim, brands? you want to come up and speak on that? <laughs> <laughs> Our VP of Ops. Okay. Um, yeah, we're working on it. We're working with our, our companies. We are testing. Uh, you know, we have, uh, fortunate for us, we got 25 corporate mm -hmm. locations spread out in the U.S. So we utilize those for tests. Um, and we've got uh, three different companies right now that we're working on deliveries and, and stuff like that, self-ordering kiosks. You know, that's, that's the future for Johnny Rockets. Good. Good. You know, something interesting about online ordering, if you... Uh, it, and I'm going to use a QSR, a fast casual prepay example, where you come in, you get a line, you order, you pay. If you do a total time of order, cash, production for guest service, and you actually take, take what percent is an order and cash, you're probably 20%, could be 25% of your total guest service time. Think about it. Your guest is telling you that you can save that or you can go put, put, the, put it somewhere else to die better throughput, so why wouldn't you do it? Right? Anybody that's not working on kiosk, online ordering, any of that, it's gonna be, fall, if already, it's already behind, it's gonna be sort of the price of entry. If you don't already have it, it's the price of entry. I, I, I work with a concept, this is full service. Uh, some of you may know it, I, again, I'm not gonna give the name, but it's there, you know what it is. This concept, what they do is, you can actually order your order before you get to the restaurant, right? When you get to the restaurant, you tell the host, Mr. Snyder, I'm here, right? They fire the order. It goes to the kitchen as you're sitting down, right? That customer wanted that speed, but they also did you a favor. They saved you around 10 to 15 minutes of table turn, right? Why wouldn't you take that free time? I call it OPT, other people's time, right? Why wouldn't you take it if they're giving it to you? So I think that's, that's, uh, that's great, and, and you just got to keep, uh, keep your eyes on that. All right, Mike, uh, case study number two. Yeah, this is, um, this is a project that Juan and I worked with um, in my last life. But, um, last life? You came back? Yes, you, I came back. I, I thought I was going to retire, but I came back. <laughs> um, but anyway, so we, we had, a, we had a, a, a brand that was doing very well. Very well. We, we grew the brand in some major pockets, because we knew we got outside those major pockets. Their brand what took a longer ramp up period of time. So as we started franchising, that franchising model said we had to start going to these new markets. So we go to these new markets, we keep the same brand, same economics, same investment cost. Well, all of a sudden, hey, that ramp up time, maybe two plus years, three years. Well, when you get a franchisee out there building the restaurant, and all of a sudden, he doesn't see that return on investment, doesn't see the AUVs where he thought he was going to be. Hey, they stop. Build one, stop. We all deal with that. We have this great pipeline, but the pipeline comes to a crashing halt if they don't see the positive um, uh, throughput. You know, for So what we had to do is we had to go back and look at the brand and figure out ways to make it more economically uh, 
uh, positive for them. So we, we knew we couldn't just take, everybody's talking about, hey, just take it out of the front of the house. With this brand, we knew we had to take it out of the back of the house too. It needed to be a lot. We had to get, reduce that footprint quite a bit. So we right size both areas is a little more complicated than just taking it out of the front. So it took us to go back in, look at re, you know, resizing the kitchen. Of course, everybody has the same obstacles when you resize the kitchen. Operations wants to say, we can't do it. So with that, we, we had that battle. We, we kept having a battle internally. So, but we didn't really have the data to tell us, hey guys, this is, this, is what it, this is how much food comes out. This is how much comes off this one piece of equipment. Hey, here's the ergonomics. Here's the amount of steps you gotta take this. We didn't have that to tell them. So again, it made it constant. We just didn't go anywhere. We were trying to evolve, it didn't go anywhere. So that's when we, we worked with profitality come in and do some time and motion studies. So we had that data to, to move the needle, to make both parties understand what the end goal was. And again, when you keep having that fight right there, we know all the time, when you design a restaurant, you really design a restaurant for what, a year, two years down the road. Sometimes it takes a year to get that thing from design. So we're like, we're losing years right now by, by months. And so when you lose years by months, you know, we, that's just, we, brought, we brought Juan in, said, hey, how are we gonna lower the, the, the overall capital? So it starts with rent, and then it starts with FF&E, and then it starts with um, uh, labor, utilities. We had to get, we had to get to every, we had to get to every dime. So, um, so we able, we're able to, to improve the efficiency of the facility. How many so, of you are owned by private equity? You know how that is, right? <laughs> could be worse, it could be public, right? That, 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 don't, them are fighting words. But you know, the rallying cry behind this exercise is the owner of that brand said, at the current cost that you have, in the current sales, in the current cycle, my brand can't grow. And they said, I want, I want you to deliver for me a concept that will cost me 25% less. The, the brand owner said, I am willing to build one of those and fail if I had to fail, right? They knew they were not gonna fail, but it's gotta get done. So they basically pushed all of us to say, okay, it's got to get done. It ain't going to come from one place. It's got, everybody's going to have to give blood. Now, one key piece here, look at number four, ensure capacity, right? Remember, sales over cost, right? You got to have, you still have to have the throughput. You still have to have the capability to do catering. If you have drive-through, drive-through. If you have eat-in, take-out, online ordering, it doesn't matter. You've got to have it. That's a non-negotiable. So, so we went at it, and, you know, we, we kind of chucked at many things. Right? Yeah, we, we, took, we took our whole... We call our little development budget from soft costs all the way down to small wares. And you know, we, some areas you took a couple thousand out, other areas they see base, the base building construction. As you see that, that was a lot of coming from changing your finishes, from going back and changing your, your um, overall square footage. So we, we, we looked at everything. We, we came back in and you know, restudied all the MEPs. The MEPs were huge. Found about 65,000 bucks in MEPs. Um, not just because of we were downsizing it, because we were not engineering to the space. We were engineering based upon some prototypical standards that the, the mechanical engineers lived by and had that be, the ability to stamp and protect them. So anyway, we, we pushed everything. I think that's the thing is we didn't look at, nothing came, um, nothing was sacred anymore. Change the paradigms, no, no doubt about it, right? That's difficult to do because the way you do things before is the way you do things again, and you're expecting a different result. What did I just describe? Insanity, right? <laughs> it's always the case, but that's what they want. But you need to come in and say, okay, hang on a second. You know, we, ha we had our marching orders from a private equity firm. That's always good to have somebody stick to the ground, say, you know, that's what I want. That's not enough, let's keep going. So we touched everything, you know, I mean, just, just you can see yeah. it, every, every single case study. Because uh, the idea is every dollar counts, right? Every single penny will, will count. Every square foot counts, right? Every square foot's gonna cost you money. Uh, our, our initial proposition is that the kitchen needs to be one square feet in size, right? If it's gonna be two square feet, you need to prove it. And from one of the speakers today, I heard that the front of the house is one four, square foot also. So we're gonna start with a two square foot uh, restaurant and we'll go from there, right? As you, as you look at, uh, at how to drive unit economics. One other one is um, an important one, actually, and I'll, and I'll give you a, um, sort of a case study in, in sorts. Ongoing cost, right? What, what's, on, what's an ongoing cost? It's an annuity. Those are really, really nice, right? Because from a financial perspective, it happens every year, you bring it to present worth and bingo, it's got a lot of value. 
So don't forget the annuities, right? Don't forget the labor, don't forget ongoing, ongoing costs, right? If you, have a, if you had a piece of equipment that's more energy efficient, maybe it costs you a little more, but it's gonna save you somewhere. So again, it's just, it's holistic. It's, you, need to, you need to go at it uh, in, in a holistic way so you can, uh, so you can gain, you can gain there, so the, the whole annuities. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, no names name for obvious reason for confidentiality. We were working on a new prototype for, for a client and we created what we called a spectrum. The spectrum said, if my operating costs stay exactly what they are today, how much capital do I need to save to make my ROI? One side of the spectrum. On the other side, if I don't save a single penny in capital, how much does my operating cost need to be, right? That gives you great guidelines to say, okay, I get it, right? So if on one end you gotta save a million dollars, that's a lot of money, even, even in full service. On the other side, it's about 2.5% of, of ongoing cost or 3% of operating cost. You begin to see that there's gotta be a little bit of everything. So labor, for example, it's a big piece, right? And it's a big piece today and tomorrow at $15 an hour, which is, you know, that train has left the station. It may not be 15 in, in three, four years, but it's gonna be, it, it's left the station. Right, in most municipalities, it's going there anyways, but it's going nowhere but up. And this is not about Republican Democrats, forget that. The train has left the station. This is about standard of living. Uh, so so you've, got to, you've got to look at, at operating costs and ongoing costs to, to make it work better. What I'd like to do is um, let me give you an industrial engineering's perspective of um, driving unit economics. So in other words, what do we do if we were to go in your place to drive unit economics, right? What is it that we do? I mean, we're, we're known as time and motion studies, right? That's an answer. Oh, you're a time and motion guy. Okay, yeah, but there's work sampling, there's all kinds of different techniques we apply. Uh, but our, our approach is, is you grab every single one of your operating parameters, every single one of them, and you look at them and say, how can I improve efficiency, right? First one's simple, processes and procedures. How do you make your product? What equipment do you use? What are the steps? What's your workstation? What's everything that goes on? And challenge it, right? And sometimes you may have to go back to your product development folks and say, by the way, if my speed of service aspiration is 10 minutes and I've got a product that at best takes me 16 minutes without any delay, it's not gonna go. It's just impossible. I, I, I appreciate that this product can drive great sales and great quality, but it's just not gonna work. So can we re-engineer? So the processes and procedures are, are critical, how you do things. Uh, the people deployment, the labor, right? Right labor in the right place at the right time. Uh, sometimes uh, a client will call us and say, okay, come in, how much labor can you save me? That's the first question they ask. And we say, well, how much labor do you want to save? Right? And they say, wait, what do you mean? Say, well, you tell me how much labor you want to save and we'll figure out how to save it. But that's the wrong way to go about labor, right? Labor is right labor in the right place at the right time to drive sales and profits and throughput and quality. Then you go from there. Because if you have the same labor and you drive sales, you just reduce labor, right? So labor is a facilitator. If you use it right, it can go very, very far for you. Uh, the place design, right? That's what I was telling you. I always start, somebody says, how big should my back of house be, right? And of course, we can, we can do benchmarks. We have all that to see what it is. And that's when I say, sarcastically, one square feet. What do you mean? Yeah, one square foot. Why does it have to be bigger than one square foot? Let's go at it, right? And every square foot you add has to have a value. And actually, um, I wrote an article recently, I read a lot in the industry, and my the title of one of them was, a one square foot back of house. When I leave here, I'm gonna write one, a one square foot front of house. Because one of the, one of the speakers told me I can do that, right? So we're gonna go to one square foot front of house, and then what's gonna be the third article I'm gonna write? A two square foot facility, right? <laughs> one plus one. I told you I'm an engineer, right? Sorry about that. Uh, platforms and technology, right? You just saw a great example that Dominic gave you where a platform drove significant, right? Significant unit economics because of what it did to the size of the hood, to the AC going up, to the labor, to the throughput, to, the, to everything. In front, it cost more, but it drove so many other variables that it just made a ton of sense, right? I'm not saying the clamshell is gonna work for all of you, I'm saying in that application, that and the shakes, the two key, the two key uh, bottlenecks that he had, right, were re-engineered using platforms, right? So, and, and don't forget, platform is also technology, right? KDS, online ordering, smartphone ordering, all that is, it's gonna drive uh, the economics in the, in the right direction. The products, right? 
So, and I, I gave an example example before about a product that had speed uh, or speed issue. But but I, I usually say uh, that the typical paradigm, in, and I'll go back to casual dyne because you see it in past casual too. You don't see it as much in, in QSR, although. As QSR begins to try to be more fast casual and full service tries to be more fast casual, right, they do this too. But the theory is if I do more prep, I'll have better quality. Maybe, maybe not, right, because you've, you've added um, inconsistency. So maybe what you need to do is get a, a vendor to sell you a product, a value-added product to come to you, and you don't have to do it anymore. At 10 bucks an hour, it's got a price, but at $15 an hour, you can buy a heck of a lot more technology. You can buy a heck of a lot more products, value-added products. So, so keep your eyes on that, right? So that's another operating parameters, right? And whatever promotions you do, right? Uh, marketing departments love to do a lot of promotions, right? Well, you know what? Be careful with the promotions. You have to have them. I, we truly believe that if you don't menu innovate, you die, right? There are a few brands that you can do an exception. Most of them realize that if you don't menu innovate, you die. But if you menu innovate wrong, what do you do? You kill yourself, <laughs> right? So you got to have uh, efficient menu innovation uh, to, to drive this in, uh, in the right direction. Okay, we're almost there. I want to I wanna share with the panel. Be ready to, to give us some final unit economic realities. I'm going to start with one, right? I'm going to start with one. Um, this is it. This is not a typo. This is not a mistake, right? Whatever you do today on unit economics, Remember I said May? It's not May. Will not work tomorrow. Will not. Because your guest is going to change. Constant change. Right? So you have to be constantly changing as well along the way. Otherwise, somebody's take you over. Somebody's get number one uh, and take your space. So, so you just got to reinvent yourself. Continuous improvement. Right? Uh, and that's the, right, that's the right mentality you need to have in your brand from top to bottom. Right? Don't sit in your laurels because you're going to be knocked off. And I'll... I'll I'll show you what happens if you do sit in your laurels with a little cartoon here. Any thoughts on that, uh, gentlemen? No, I think, you know, I think when you hit success, everybody, everybody celebrates. When you hit success, you got to think about what's going on next year. Because again, what you're designing today is still not going out to the market for another year or so. So again, everybody's already thought about what you're doing because I, right now with Nukes, hey, we're hitting some good things. We have, we have a lot of good things going for us, but we're already looking at our next prototype, or I design our next prototype, thinking about integrating those online orders that drive through that mentality, which is totally outside our, our, our sandbox. But you know, if we don't do that, we know that we're not going to continue to be hitting that press that we had in 2016. Yeah, for us, I think the, uh, the trick was to convince the franchise community, because we're basically a franchise company. And uh, we did that. We have the data. They've seen it now. And uh, I'd have to say most of them are on board, and, and we're going to start rolling this new high-efficiency kitchen out, uh, especially new restaurants, and we're doing a lot of remodels. But we're already at the corporate office looking at our menu and looking how we take that next step. So as we continue to roll out this high-efficiency kitchen, we're testing other equipment. We bring, we, I added a bunch of circuits in our break room at the office. We're bringing in equipment. We're trying new products. So we're going to be constantly e evolving and trying to you know, stay ahead of it. Very good, very good. Thank you. So, so what, what's the risk of not continuing to improve your unit economics? Yeah. Well, death, yeah, eventually. Who said that? <laughs> you, you, you will be hired for the next panel. You know? He read ahead. Did he, he, he read, read ahead. ahead. He read ahead. Actually, I spoke to him earlier and I gave okay. him the answer. You know? <laughs> He's cheating. That's okay. Thank you. But you become an ostrich, right? What's an ostrich do when, when they're scared and when they think they got it? What do they do? Man's in. Ah, right. Everything's just fine. What's showing? But <laughs> bang, right? <laughs> you become an ostrich, okay? What's my next slide? This is you, right? Do not become an ostrich, right? Because you know what? There's a. I mean, you can have a little one or a big one, but it's always showing. And someone and your competitors are going to kick it. Trust me. They love to do nothing more than just, than just kick it. So don't become an ostrich. Drive you in economics on and on. Questions and discussion. Give me your economics or give me death. I'm going to do on time. Look at that. 4.30. Good. 4.30 to a drink. Question. I'm that close. We're that close to a drink.
bit. Um, I, I work with Dominic. I'm, I'm in charge of U.S. operations, and you know, it, it it really is on all ends of the equation. And one of the things we didn't have, I don't think, was a lot of um, you know working together, cooperation, teamwork in the departments because everyone has a part, right? So marketing in our express locations is critical. They the mini board style. Uh, how quickly someone can read the menu, what they choose off the menu, will drive economics, right? Um, if people will walk away in a mall if they can't get fast enough service. So that clamshell drove capacity mm -hmm. to, to get food out, but it didn't drive the decision-making process for the order taking, or you know the packaging, or how you deliver the food, um, whether you hand condiments out or they have to go someplace to get them. Those little things, right? And then, um, you know, on the clamshell itself, even that, when we talk about evolution, we had a puck of meat that was so high that we could only put three on a, on a platen. There's three platens on the grill. We could only put three on there at a time. So we redesigned the puck to be not as high and a little bit wider, and now we can put four pucks on a platen, increasing our, our throughput 33% on that grill. Um, so, you know, we, we worked with operations, that's R&D, um, operations was, you know, company came up with a puck idea, and marketing, you know, working with them on, on the design, and, you know, so it's, it's little things like that, um, where the different departments are working together. I think, I think that the, collaboration is what the, it the is. Part, the part there is collaboration. Everybody know, how many of you know Piata? That's Piata. A very interesting concept, right? Very, very, very neat concept. If you haven't gone to Piata, go to Piata because it's, it's worth it. I'll give, you, I'll give you what I would do, right? Uh, much like the example that Mar Mike, uh, Mike and I had to do uh, with, oh, I almost said the name. We can't say the name. <laughs> uh, there's a rallying cry. There, there's a purpose why you're doing what you need to do. What I would suggest you do is you start with a P&L, right? The reality is a reality. How much is it costing you to build it today? What's it costing you to run it? Under that condition, is there a need to re-engineer, to change the uh, unit economics? I have no idea, yeah. right? But you may have the right unit economics. Your executives may be happy with it. Why are you going to be pushing water upstream if they're going to say, no, I'm OK with it. I, I just not willing. I'd say that's a mistake because you continue to improve. But that starts with there. And that's going to show you where you're at. A key is benchmarks. Grab other benchmarks, right? Whomever you, again, I know you're very unique. But, but I would venture to say any post-pay system that's out there is piata. Whether you're selling burritos or pizzas or tacos, it doesn't matter, right? It, it is a piata, right? How are they doing it? What does that benchmark look at? What's the square footage of the front? What's the square footage of the back? What's the food cost? What's the equipment cost, right? And now all of a sudden you create, you create a framework that says, okay, I get it. Am I in trouble or am I not in trouble? How many can I grow like this? What's my return on investment? That's what I suggest you do. Kind of get on the financial. Get on the. I usually I usually say that the truth will set you free. Right? That is the truth. Right? If your unit economics is wrong, if your unit economics is wrong. That's you. Right? So well, you, know, you can't kid. That's what I would do. Uh, well, next. you know, one. It, it it really became a holistic approach. It took. We had every leader of every department in our in the room. So operations. You know, you got your your purchasing team. You got your marketing team, you got your, the president was in the room. Hey, we had some very, very uncomfortable conversations. It mm -hmm. was, hey, they're screaming, yelling, there's, hey, you don't know what you're doing, you're killing the brand. There's all kinds of that conversation that went on. But again, data and facts drove everything. And again, when you start getting that data and facts piece, it's hard to say that's not correct when you got mm -hmm. true data. So it did, you know, so again, it took, him, it took us to have a moderator to go, <laughs> man, to go collect the data and then present it back to people. And I had to shut up yeah. then. A gutsy executive team. You just got to have a gutsy executive team. I, I'll tell you, I've worked with, sometimes with brands, not too often, but it's happened. You know, they bring us in and we try to say what they need to change and they start telling you why it won't change. You know what I tell them? I said, I'll tell you what. Next time, sign the proposal, give me the money, I will not show up, we will not tell anybody, and everybody's going to be happier for it, right? Why didn't you hire us, right? It's got to require an executive and a focus to say, that is our target, and it's not our rear end that we have a target. That's what I would suggest you do. We have time for one more question. Or we may have time for happy hour. I'm sorry? 
I think we do we have time for happy hour? Let's vote for happy hour. It's got zero, but you started early. You know that. I'm concerned about I'm concerned about their microphone. drinks, man. Yeah. Oh, the drinks. Okay. Yeah. We'll be at the round table. So as no. long as you buy me a drink, we'll we'll, we'll continue to talk. I will. No, thank you guys so much. Excellent conversation. Important topic.